are listening to the Healthy Christian Women Podcast. Brought to you by Fit Plus Faith, the podcast for Christian women to grow healthier in their mind, body, and spirit. Jumpstart your health with your complimentary mind, body, and spirit detox checklist at healthychristianwomen.com slash detox. That's healthychristianwomen.com forward slash detox. Here's your host, Dr. Melody Stevens. Hello and welcome to the Healthy Christian Women podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Melody Stevens. Welcome to season four, where we're talking about everything that has to do with natural and non-toxic living. And I am so excited to be bringing you another incredible interview this morning from someone that I met um, a month or two ago through another conference. And I knew immediately that he would be the perfect guest for our podcast. So I'm so excited to introduce you to Chris Work. Chris, thank you so much for being here this morning. Thanks for having me. Yes, absolutely. So I met you about a month and a half or so ago. You were another speaker at a conference that I was at with my incredible friend, Jamie Cross, who is the founder of MIG. And I actually just featured her on the podcast in our most previous episodes. So people that are following along, they're going to be introduced to Jamie and hear of MIG. And I was there at the incredible um, annual conference that we have, and you were one of the guest speakers. And your story and everything that you've been through in your anti-cancer journey, ultimately, the way that God has led you to beat cancer through returning to nature and plant-based food is so incredible. Incredible. And so you are now the author of three books. The most recent, I'm very excited to share with everyone, is The Beat Cancer Kitchen, a plant based anti cancer recipe cookbook. It is so beautiful and so amazing and like full color. I mean, everybody look at this. It's totally amazing. You're going to want this and you're going to love it. And you got to write this with your wife. But prior to that, you also have two other books. Your Chris Beat Cancer is your primary book where you talk about your story and your journey, which we're going to dive into today. And then one that I can't wait to get my hands on as well is the Beat Cancer Daily, a daily devotional that dives into mindset and setting your heart and your mind, because we know that our heart and our mind have so much to do with the health of our body too. And God tells us that in Proverbs. And so it is incredible what you're up to. I'm so excited to have you here. And so... Let's dive into your journey. Yeah, I was diagnosed with stage three colon cancer when I was 26 years old, and this was in December 2003, really uh, just a few days before Christmas. So I'm coming up on my 18 year cancer anniversary here, just uh, you know, in about a couple week and a half. And um, you know, cancer diagnosis is pretty scary at any age, but it's especially uh, traumatic, I think, for a young person because you know you feel like you have so much life. Uh, ahead of you and then this threatens to cut it very short and um so that was uh that was a big interruption in my life and my plans i was a newlywed i'd been married for two years i was a musician writing music playing shows making plans to tour um i was in real estate as an entrepreneur i had started buying investment properties and fixing them up and renting them out and had had been doing that for a couple of years and was everything was going well. I was really excited about, you know, my future and uh, and the things I was doing. I was I was really living the life that I wanted to live. And uh, it, it was just, you know, just getting going, <laughs> really, and uh, feeling very hopeful and optimistic about the future. And um, but in 2003, I started having abdominal pain and I went to, you know, the doctor sort of toward the end of the year in the winter uh, because the pain got worse and worse over time. And they did a colonoscopy. They found a golf ball sized tumor in my colon, which that is the large intestine. And um, they told me I needed nine to 12 months of chemotherapy. <clears throat> Excuse me. They told me I needed to get have surgery first uh, to get this thing out of me before it spreads and kills you. That's what they said. And so uh, chemotherapy was not discussed at that point. And um, I was also a very typical cancer patient, you know, in, in a lot of ways, because I had no experience with the disease. I had never really had anyone close to me go through cancer, so I didn't see firsthand the progression uh, of cancer that, you know, sort of the, the slow, destructive nature of cancer treatments and what they do to people. And, you know, cancer patients are often, you know, held up in the media as, um, you know, this is the face of cancer, right? 
Uh, but that's the face of cancer treatment, right? Cancer doesn't make your hair fall out, okay? That's chemotherapy. Right. So cancer doesn't look like that. Cancer doesn't do that to people. Um, and so anyway, I, I just didn't really, all I knew was that chemotherapy is like super toxic and it makes you look really bad and it makes your hair fall out. Like I, I just barely knew anything about it. And the, the tragedy of the cancer treatment industry, and I talk about this in great detail in my first book, Chris Beat Cancer. It's really, there's five chapters that are basically an expose on the, the medical, pharmaceutical, and cancer industries. But <clears throat> there's a number of problems. But one of the biggest is that patients are rushed into treatment out of fear. Mm -hmm. They don't know what they're getting into. They have no idea what the risks and the side effects are. They're, they have no idea whether the treatment's going to cure them or not. Um, and they, again, don't have time to think or research or change their life or anything. I mean, it's, it's crazy how fast you're rushed in. I mean, they wanted to have me in surgery within a couple of days. Some patients are starting chemo within a couple of days or radiation within a couple of days of a diagnosis. That's very, very typical. <clears throat> so, uh, and these treatments are brutal. Mm -hmm. They're destructive. They can cause serious harm. They can kill you. And uh, as, as a patient advocate now, it's, it's my responsibility to help people understand what they're getting into mm -hmm. before they say yes, right? If you want to make an informed decision, if you want to, to have wisdom, you, you cannot be wise. You cannot make a wise decision if you don't acquire knowledge. Mm -hmm. Knowledge produces wisdom and uh, knowledge takes a little time. <laughs> mm -hmm. it takes time to learn things. And if you don't make time to learn things, then you are flying blind, right? You are, you're setting yourself up for failure, disaster, and um, a lot of unexpected surprises. And usually they're not good ones. And that's, that's any, in anything in life. So I, uh, again, I didn't know anything about cancer, or, but you know, so I just was like, okay, I guess I'll have surgery. The doctors say I have to have it. Everybody says I have to have surgery. So I was able to, to postpone it about a week and a half because I didn't want to be in the hospital over Christmas because that was super depressing. And so I went in on December 30th. They took out a third of my large intestine, which is where the tumor was. And when I woke up, they said, it's worse than we thought. You're stage 3C. We were hoping it'd be stage 2, which stage 2 means you have surgery and you go home and you're done. Stage 3 means you have surgery and then you have chemo. 9 to 12 months is what they recommended for me. And uh, so... All of a sudden now, the, you know, my, my prospects got much more grim and when they initially told me that I needed to have chemotherapy, I mean, I was on a lot of really heavy drugs in the hospital and I was like, okay, I guess I gotta do chemo. Um, but when I got home and I was sobering up and I weaned myself off the pain medicine, and I got my wits about me and I really started thinking about my life and my health and my future and what I wanted out of life. Um, and I was thinking about my, you know, chemotherapy and I thought it didn't make sense to me. The idea of poisoning your way back to health mm. didn't make sense. Again, I didn't know anything about the cancer industry. I just knew chemo was toxic. It was going to make me really sick. And I knew I was vulnerable physically because uh, I was very thin. I'd lost a lot of weight. And it just, I didn't have peace about it. So I prayed, my wife and I prayed together one day and I just said, God, if there's another way besides chemotherapy, please show me. I don't know what to, I don't know what to do. I'm lost. I'm, you know, I'm desperate. I need some help. <laughs> and, uh, and also, you know, it, it was a prayer of faith because one of the first verses that came to me was Romans 8, 28, which says, we know that God works all things for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. And, you know, I, I talk about this specific verse. This is one of the biggest verses of my life mm. because that verse sounds nice. And, uh, you know, it's like, oh, that's nice. That's a nice sentiment. But when you're in crisis, that, that verse is like, it's, that's your lifeline. You know, that is, 
you know, God works all things for the good of those who love him. All things, everything that happens to you, he will work for the good. And, and Paul wrote that after being beaten multiple times, left for dead, imprisoned, shipwrecked, right? He had been through hell, literally, you know, hell on earth, and wrote that after all of these things had happened to him. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so that gave me a tremendous amount of, you know, encouragement. Mm-hmm. And, I, and, and it really, that's where the rubber meets the road is faith is easy when your life's good and you got no problems. It's easy. When things get hard, then you have to really get honest with yourself. What do I really believe? Right. You know, am I really a believer? Right. Do I believe that God's word is true, that these promises are for me? Mm. And uh, so I had to say, you know, what's the alternative? Well, I can doubt it and just be have more fear and misery, or I can choose to believe it and be strengthened in my faith. And so, yeah, I made the choice to believe. That's all faith is, right? Yeah. It's a, it's choosing to believe. So, you know, as I as I prayed and asked for for you know help and and if there's another way besides chemotherapy, please show me. I, you know, it was also just thank you for providing for me for working all things for my good. I trust you. I know you'll supply all of my my needs. And um, two days later, I got a book that was sent to me from a man in Alaska who. Uh, heard about my situation because he knew my dad and he mails me a book and it was written by another guy who had healed his colon cancer like 25 years prior by radically changing his diet and lifestyle. And that guy's name was George Malcolmus. He was still alive. I start reading his book and it just, it, it was amazing. Like I knew, I don't know, a few pages in, I knew it was an answer to prayer. I, I, I prayed this showed up, right? This isn't the answer to my prayer. And so that was a big wake up call for me because I'd never heard anyone, I'd never heard anyone say, Hey, cancer is caused by our diet and lifestyle, right? Like most chronic disease is caused by our diet and lifestyle in the Western world in industrialized nations. These, there's a difference between chronic disease and infectious disease, mm-hmm. right? And, um, Chronic disease is also known as a disease of affluence. Affluence. That means these are diseases that rich people get. (laughs) And when I say rich people, you may be thinking, well, I'm not rich. Yes, you are. Right. right? Yes, you are compared to the poorest people in the world. Right. If you make $30,000 a year, you're in the 1%. It's incredible. Of richest people in the world. (laughs) Okay. So... If you live in a country with giant uh, factories that produce food for you and giant factory farms that that raise animals to kill for your uh, your happy meals, <laughs> you're rich. OK, <laughs> so uh, but but there is a. Um, you know, there is a paradox to to wealth, and that is uh, overconsumption, excess indulgence. And right. that leads to chronic diseases and cancer, heart disease, diabetes, many, many autoimmune type diseases and brain diseases, degenerative diseases mm-hmm. are all linked to our diet and lifestyle. So this was this was amazing for me. I mean, this revelation was so huge because, I, I, you know, I've the problem, one of the many problems, as I have started to allude to in medicine as a whole, not just the cancer treatment world, mm-hmm. is that. I'll give a cancer example. The patient says, why did I get cancer? And the doctor says, well, we don't know. You know, it, it, it may be genetic or it may just be bad luck. And there are thousands and thousands of studies published, peer-reviewed studies on the causes of cancer in our world. They are known. Mm-hmm. And the diet and lifestyle causes are known. And doctors are not told this in their medical education. Most of them don't spend time re- reading and researching about these topics after med school. So they have nothing to say. And they actually believe that your diet doesn't matter. And they will tell patients, no, it doesn't matter what you eat. Wow. No, it wasn't your diet. No, it wasn't stress. No, uh, you don't need to take supplements. Don't get on the internet, right? You just need to show up for treatment. And And what happens is they basically turn this person into a powerless victim 
right. of disease. Mm -hmm. That is what the, that's that's what you do to somebody when you tell them, oh, there's nothing you did. You have no control over your life. You have no responsibility. You're just a victim. That's it. And your only hope is us. Right. Right. Your only hope is show up for treatment and we'll do the best we can. You just cross your fingers and say your little prayers right. and go home and, and make sure you, you eat, get enough calories. So make sure you're eating ice cream and drinking milkshakes and eat whatever you want. Don't change anything about your life. And uh, this, in my, in my opinion, as a patient advocate and survivor is medical negligence, right? borderline criminal medical negligence because of the clear and substantial research science that shows that diet and lifestyle interventions can improve survival uh, and save lives. Right. Right. Improve quality of life, increase survival, and lead to ultimate healing and restoration of health. So I'm not demonizing doctors. They're trapped in a system that pays them really well, and it doesn't matter what the results are. It doesn't matter if you die. They get paid, right? You live, you die. It's no, it doesn't matter, right? They still get paid. And many doctors, I, I've got m many, many friends who are doctors, and I have so much respect for them, especially the ones that have, you know, had the wake-up call and become uh, holistic and integrative and functional. Right. Uh, these are my heroes mm -hmm. because they broke out of a system that is so rigid and controlling. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you even dare question pharmaceutical medicine, you're instantly a quack. Right. I mean, it, it is a, it's a vicious, vicious, um, you know, sort of like old boys cl club, basically. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, doctors of internal medicine, that's a, that's a type of doctorate degree, right? Internal medicine. What's internal medicine? It's drugs. <laughs> You're a, dro a doctor who's, who's expertly trained in drugs. That's, that's what you are now. And it's such a difficult profession that doctors have one of the highest rates of suicide mm -hmm. of any profession right and it's not difficult physically necessarily but the mental and emotional right. toll that it takes on on these people who got into it because well, most of them because they care and they want to make a difference and they want to help people and they want to save lives like and they're just grind grinded down in med school and in residency into just sort of like automatons you know <laughs> it's like there's sort of this zombie there's this very stereotypical zombie doctor who, who has lost the capacity to think for themselves. They're just told what to think and they just repeat what they're told. So how did that and, hurt for you when you began to be like, I don't want to go this route. I want to go a more holistic route. Like, did you have resistance to that? Did you have to find different doctors that would support you in that? I did. So I read this guy's book and what he talked about was, uh, he converted to a raw food diet, started juicing. And I thought it was, and I was like, wow, this is really interesting. Raw foods, going back to the Garden of Eden, mm -hmm. okay? Like man's original diet in the Garden of Eden was fruits and vegetables. That was it, nothing else. And I thought, this is really, this is pretty interesting. I wonder what would happen if I did that. So I was excited and I, and I realized, hey, the way I'm living is killing me. Mm. And if the way I'm living is killing me, right? This is if then logic. If the way I'm living is killing me, then I should probably change the way I'm living. If my, my diet and lifestyle and, and my mindset, and my attitude, if, if the, my entire life, the way I'm living life is contributing to my illness, then I can, maybe I can change and contribute to my wellness. Right. So I was very encouraged. You know, that gave me so much hope that I had control over my life. I wasn't a victim of disease, right? And I say this in my, I say this a lot, but I talk about it in the Beat Cancer Daily. Everything in life happens for a reason. And most of the time, the reason is you. <laughs> You're the reason, okay? Sometimes it's other people. Most of the time, it's you, <laughs> okay? 
And if you take that responsibility, what are you talking about? This is called personal. (laughs) Thank you. Personal responsibility. It's a wild idea. It's a a radical revolutionary concept (laughs) that you are in control of your life and you can't blame anybody else for your life. Yes. And um, and it's empowering. You, You realize you have the power to make different choices every day, and those choices will produce different results in the future. Every day you're sowing seeds yep. of health or disease. Right. You're sowing seeds of success or failure every day. And there will be a harvest in the future. Yep. There will be a harvest. What do you want to reap? Right? right. Do you want to reap success and health and happiness? Or do you want to reap reap misery and despair and debt? Right. Exactly. And so and disease. So I uh, I converted to a raw food diet overnight, 100 percent raw fruits and vegetables, all organic, I bought a juicer. You know, I was just like, I'm doing this 100% right now. Let's go. And um, I didn't have a bunch of studies. I didn't have any scientific degree, right? I mean, I didn't have, all I had were my instincts and intuition and one person's story. Right. But that that story resonated with me. I believed him. I believed him. And it wasn't hard to believe his claim that, uh, food was making us sick, right? The wrong food is making us sick. That's too much meat and dairy, processed food, fast food, and junk food loaded with all these artificial flavors, colors, additives, and preservatives, like chemicals that you were never meant to ingest. Right. That didn't even okay. exist until a few, less than a few hundred years ago, less than, you know, 60 years ago, it didn't exist. Yeah. That, you know, these chemicals were created by the factory food industry to make foods last longer on the shelf or look better or be softer or chewier or whatever, right? Or more colorful. Like you're not meant to put this stuff in your body. And so, <laughs> sure, it doesn't give you cancer overnight. You know, right. like <clears throat> a Twizzler is not going to give you cancer, right? But that's not food. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like, I don't know what a Twizzler is. Yes. But, uh, it's food like product. I remember it's, hearing it's, that a few years ago and I loved that phrase, food like yeah. product. And like that describes so much of the food that is in the grocery stores. <laughs> right. Everything is edible. Right? <laughs> right. Everything is edible. And you know, there's everything out there in the world you can put in your mouth and swallow. Right. But is it actually good for you? Yes. And that's a scripture as well. It basically says, um, Everything is basically says everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. <laughs> like, right, you have free right. will to do what you want, make the choice you want. It is what it is, but it just may not be beneficial for you. <laughs> That's right. And so it was easy for me to believe that, that, um, that fruits and vegetables were, would do me good. And that if I consumed uh, uh, copious amounts of them, that maybe something really good would happen. Mm. And I could empower my body to heal. If I gave it an abundance, if I flooded my body with nutrition, right? I like to describe as overdosing on nutrition, Mm -hmm. which is not possible, right? It's sort of a, you know, oxymoronic statement, right? You can't overdose on nutrition, but you can give your body an abundance of, of nutrients from food, from the earth that it can use to repair, regenerate, detoxify, and heal. And it will use what it needs and it won't use what it doesn't. And so so I changed my diet overnight. People around me uh, thought I'd lost my mind. (laughs) My wife, you know, family members, my mom supported me. I was curious if your wife was on board right away or if it's taken her a while to get to the place where she'll make a cookbook with you. (laughs) Obviously, she came around. (laughs) Yeah, it took her 17 years. No. uh, (laughs) she came from a so our families were a little different my mom was was a health food you know was into health food and had stacks and stacks of books on health food and healthy living and uh, alternative cancer therapies she had read these books before i mean she never had cancer we didn't have cancer in our family or anything but she had compiled this library of books from all of these health and wellness uh doctors and leaders and influencer type people dating way back to the 1970s. So she had like 30 years of books, uh, and uh, which was a miracle in itself. Mm-hmm. And so she supported my decision. It made sense to her. And then, uh, but my wife's side of the family, they were very conventional. And it's like, you go to the doctor for everything, you know? 
And so they were very much pressuring me, like, you know, you got to go to go see the oncologist. You need to do chemo, you, you know. And so I reluctantly agreed to go see an oncologist and the meeting did not go well. I mean, it was just, he was rude to us and condescending. And I, I tell the whole story in my book, but mm -hmm. basically we were treated really badly. And um, he, he said, if you don't do chemotherapy, you're insane. Wow. So after that, my wife's opinion of the medical industry changed, mm. right? That was, that was a, you know, that sort of exposed the, the seedy underbelly of cancer treatment to her. And so, because they use so much fear mm -hmm. to manipulate patients into doing what they say. Mm -hmm. And they don't have enough time, even the good doctors, they don't have enough time to really teach you anything, right? Doctor means teacher. They don't teach you anything, okay? They're just telling you this is what you're gonna do next. Mm -hmm. and you got 20 minutes, right? And if you saw that doctor in the grocery store three days later, they probably won't remember your name, right? Right. And you're trusting your life, literally your life, to a person who is not going to, doesn't know your name, <laughs> right? Because they see so many patients every day, mm -hmm. right? They're seeing 30 patients, 40, 50 patients a day. I mean, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, didn't, I didn't like that type of uh, cattle, you know, cattle, medicine mm -hmm. and uh or you're just a, you're basically just a social security number right and the better insurance you have the more treatments you get mm -hmm. which is actually not necessarily a good thing because patients sort of become like atms mm -hmm. right if you've got really good insurance they you're going to get the works and the works is not like the works at a massage par parlor <laughs> you know what i mean it's like every drug every treatment every therapy every scan is like it's you know over treatment this is a major problem uh over treatment is because it's driven by money treatments make money mm -hmm. yes um private and you know private practice oncologists make up to two-thirds of their income off of chemotherapy drugs think about that two-thirds right so if you make three hundred thousand a year 200 of it is from chemo does that sound like a perverse incentive it is right? Oncology is the only segment of medicine where the doctors profit off of the drugs they prescribe. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah. I mean, you know, you go to your regular GP and you have the flu and he prescribes Tamiflu. Well, you go to the pharmacy and you buy it there. You don't buy it from him. So anyway, I'm not recommending Tamiflu, by the way, just an <laughs> example. So yeah, so they, they make this ridiculous amount of money uh, off of the, the profit on chemo drugs. So it's the system is set up to incentivize the doctors to prescribe a lot of chemo. Well, guess who came up with that system, right? The drug companies. The drug companies realize, how can we get convinced doctors to give poison to their patients? We pay them really well <laughs> to do it. That's how. So um, that, you know, chemo has been going for 60 years and in 60 years, the, the death rate from cancer has only come down 5%. Wow. 5% overall in 60 years. That is a, an abject dismal failure mm -hmm. in the war on cancer. Mm -hmm. And yet billions of dollars have been made right while failing to win the war <laughs> so like right. yeah the most lucrative failure ever it is a system driven by greed and profits doesn't care about people and that's the larger medical system as a whole mm -hmm. generally speaking i mean look we've seen what's happened in the last year and a half uh we've seen people manipulated out of fear and when all this started happening i was like i know this playbook this is they've been doing this in cancer yeah for decades. This right. is the, I know this playbook. This is, we create fear and, uh, and then you make people really, really afraid repeating these scary messages, and then you give them a solution and then they scramble for it. But the solution is a drug rush to market with almost no testing at all. Two right. months of testing, no long-term testing. Right. And, uh, the typical drugs take five to 10 years and they had two months. And so, 
that was those are huge red flags to me but we saw how many people just scrambled to, just to get this these new drugs as fast as they could so the same and thing happens in on the back end <laughs> what's that these companies have made billions on the back end in the past oh yes yeah yeah, yeah. They're, pfizer monetary, I think they're, i've heard this somewhere before there's a big monetary gain happening here pfizer i think is going to make you know over 30 billion uh and right so it was a big money grab and um very very tragic I hate to see it and a lot of people have been harmed people have died and uh, I mean, it'll take years for them to really piece together this puzzle. But even just this week that, you know, Pfizer released the, through a court order, released the study, the results of their first 90 days of data they collected on people they gave the the, the new drug to. And uh, it's like 1,200 deaths and I don't know, 100 plus thousand uh, adverse events, 180,000, something like that. Hundreds of miscarriages. And, and the, the crazy thing is that Pfizer petitioned the court to let them keep the record sealed for 55 years. It's 75 now. Oh, they 75? They repetitioned and asked for an additional 20 years. So 75 <laughs> years they want to release the data piece by piece. I'm like, this isn't a red flag for you. Are you kidding me? Yeah, 75 like, years guarantees that everybody working there now will be dead. Right. Right. And you can't go to jail when you're dead. Right. So, yeah, I mean, look, you don't need a college degree or a, a high school diploma to understand corruption. Right. It's pretty obvious, right? You want to bury something for 75 years? You right. got something to hide. So that's a little rabbit trail. But the point is, the pharmaceutical industry controls the media, they control politicians, they control the government regula regulatory agencies. Right. They're the, the, one of the most powerful industries in the world, people don't realize. And uh, they control medicine, right? They control healthcare. And so it's not about you. They don't care about you. They care about the bottom line, selling more drugs, making more money. And if you care about you, then you have to take control of your own health and you have to learn, educate yourselves, acquire knowledge so that you can make wise decisions about your health. Right. So I was faced with that, right? I was faced with life and death and I decided to radically change my life. That was more, that made more sense to me than just jumping on the chemo train. And uh, it was really tough because, you know, when you're on the chemo train, everybody loves you. You're a hero. You're a warrior. You're a fighter. We made t-shirts for you. Right. We baked cookies. We're going to run a race for you. Right. Right. Uh, we'll bring you snacks and cupcakes and diet Cokes and it's chairs are comfy. And look, we made you a blanket and some mittens. This is the way people treat you when you do chemo. Right. Uh, you don't do chemo. You're on your own, buddy. It's crickets. Yeah. You are hacking your way through the jungle alone. And that was both those, both of those prospects are scary. And it's really hard for people to say no, because everyone's telling you, you have to do this. Right. Right. Kind of like right now, everybody's saying you have to get that new drug that we don't have any long-term side effect data on. Right. You have to do it, but I don't want to do it. No, you have to. So cancer patients are manipulated into treatment out of fear and coercion. And the treatments for the most part don't work, uh, don't cure them. When I say work, uh, there's different definitions in the medical industry of effectiveness and if something is effective or if it's, if it works, that, that doesn't mean you're cured. It doesn't mean you're healthy or well. It means in some study, it did something right in a study, this drug <clears throat> shrank the tumor. So it's effective, right? Because it shrinks the tumor, it's an effective drug. Well, the tumor just grows back, right? Once the drug's out of your system. Mm. And this is the way that most chemo drugs work. They, they'll shrink tumors. Sometimes the tumors disappear, but they don't kill the cancer stem cells. And the cancer stem cells uh, were the instigators of the whole problem to begin with. And so they start multiplying again, except that in the process of chemotherapy, the stem cells became more aggressive. They became resistant. Well, they're already resistant, but then they become more aggressive 
uh, in many cases. And oh, also, by the way, your immune system is now decimated mm -hmm. by the chemo drugs because they wreck your bone marrow. Not to mention causing brain damage, liver damage, lung damage, ovarian, cervical, digestive damage, kidney damage. So it's head to toe damage. But the, the most important damage is to your, immu your immune system. So now you're in a place where you have more aggressive cancer stem cells and no immune system. And what do you think is going to happen? It spreads really fast. And anybody listening to me or watching this, almost all of you have seen someone in your life that got cancer, they did treatment, and they're like, yeah, I'm cancer free, let's go to Chili's. And then a few months later, it's like, oh, they found spots in my liver, or in my bones or my lungs or my brain. I don't know how this could happen. The doctors know exactly how it happened. Mm. And they just act like we don't know. Yeah, they just do this, this uh, egregious, false, sympathetic, you know, we don't know, you know, we just don't know how we did the best we could, you know, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the key to cancer survival is your immune system. It's also mm -hmm. the key to preventing infectious disease. How about that? Mm -hmm. Person with tumors and a person with no tumors, the, the difference between those two people is their immune system. Mm -hmm. So your immune system <clears throat> keeps you well, it protects you, it helps you heal faster, you may get sick, but you recover. That's what a strong immune system does. And it's important to understand what is suppressing our immune system. Well, the Western diet certainly does, mm -hmm. because it's deficient in so many wonderful nutrients from fruits and vegetables that that support strong immunity. Mm -hmm. Blueberries boost your natural killer cells. Just one of many examples. Right. Um, the most potent anti-cancer vegetables uh, I ate every single day mm -hmm. as much as I could. I just was stuffing them in my body. And that's the allium and cruciferous families, the garlic, onions, leeks, broccoli, cauliflower, kale, cabbage, bok choy, Brussels sprouts, wasabi, horseradish, right? A lot of these vegetables that we don't eat much in the U.S. We eat just a bunch of potatoes and tomatoes. You know? <laughs> it's true. And onions. Yeah. And, and the onions are great, though. <laughs> but on the on the cover of my book, this is the giant cancer fighting salad. This is what I ate wow. every single day so for beautiful. lunch and dinner every day, every day, every day, because I figured out these yeah. are the most potent anti-cancer foods. I need to put these foods yeah. in my body uh, as in, in in the as much as possible every day. Right. It's like if this is going to help me, I should do it every day. Yeah. And that was my question was in this in this recipe cookbook, but also in your own journey you know, being intentional about finding the foods that support the immune system, you know, and being intentional about those. And you already, you just answered that question, like all the cruciferous vegetables, like being very intentional about those, you know, yep. being, having a wide range of fruits and vegetables is great because they all provide something different, but you're kind of honing in on some specifics that are really right. powerful for you. Yeah. The cruciferous vegetables are the most potent for sure. And then again, the allium, garlic, onions, and leeks. Berries, incredible. Uh, legumes are wonderful. Everything in the produce department right. is great. All of it. It's all good. And if that's all you ate, you're, you're going to do yourself an incredible benefit. Yeah. And so, and it's not just one meal, like one healthy meal. I'm going to have a, start having salads once a week. That's, that's mm -hmm. nothing. Like, that's mm -hmm. not enough. Yeah. You know, massive action produces massive results. You got to take massive action if you really want it to change your life. Yeah. And so that's what I did. And, um, you know, once I, once I learned, you know, kind of got a, got that going and got that routine going, I started exercising, exercise boosts your immune system. And then I started kind of reading and researching and I went from book to book to book. And I was just learning and learning, trying to figure out what else can I do to help myself. And I realized that, you know, your mind and your emotional life, emotional health is huge. Right. And it, you, your immune system is suppressed by stress. Right. Fear, worry, anxiety, and doubt suppress right. your immune system. It's We're at unprecedented levels of fear and worry in the world right now because of a corrupt pharmaceutical, governmental, and media sort of, uh, you know, cabal, <laughs> right? To mm -hmm. spread fear, mm -hmm. right? And 
you've got people who are more vulnerable to disease now because they're in constant fear. Absolutely. When you when you go outside and you look, walk, see people walking with a mask on, alone, driving with a mask on, alone. This is not science. The, the, you know, oh, it makes them feel better. This is superstition, right? That's what it has devolved into. It's become uh, superstition and germophobia. That's what people are suffering from now, right? They, make no mistake, they're suffering. They're not in freedom. They're not in joy. They don't have peace, right? Right. They have lingering, constant or persistent fear, worry, and anxiety. They're trying to alleviate that fear with a piece of fabric over their face. And <clears throat> there's better ways to alleviate fear. <laughs> I had to learn how to deal with fear when I had cancer because every day that that's a real fear creeping in sure. every day. Wow. And, you know, it's like when I saw people getting worried about uh, a virus, I'm like, look, try having cancer. Okay. Because people in our community, they know what real fear is. Mm. Right. And this fear is not coming from the media. This fear is coming from inside because you know you have a disease that can kill you. And versus like, oh, what if I get it? Right. It's very different having a deadly life threatening disease than being af afraid of something that 99.85% of people survive under 70. So, uh, I learned to give my fear and worry to God every day. Every yeah. time fear would creep in, I would just say, I trust you. I'm not going to be afraid. Amen. Right? I would feel it, right? I would feel the fear, but I would just have to catch it right in that moment and surrender it and just take that those thoughts captive and say, I trust you. I'm not going to be afraid. I'm not going to let this steal my joy. Mm. That's powerful. That is a habit that you have to form. It is a yeah. mental practice. It's a discipline. Yeah. Right, you have to catch your thoughts. You got to get a hold of them. You can't let your thoughts run away with you, right? Absolutely. And because they will, like you know, your mind will start just just going, 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 going. You think about every worst case scenario. What if this? What if that? And uh, I talk about this a lot in Beat Cancer Daily, the devotional. It's like really getting control of your mind and your thoughts, and uh, you know, doing things every day that foster joy and gratitude. Right. So when you're in a state of stress, whether it's fear about the future or it's envy and jealousy, you know, for people in the present that, you know, uh, or you're focused on the past, guilt and shame for your mistakes, right, right. or a bitterness and resentment toward people who've hurt you. Right. All of these negative thoughts and emotional states, whether they're rooted in the past, the present or the future, they all produce stress. And that state of stress suppresses your immune system. It puts you in what's called fight or flight, which is elevated cortisol and adrenaline, which is not a physical state in which your body can heal efficiently and effectively. You have two states. You've got fight or flight and you've got rest and digest. Fight or flight is called sympathetic nervous system dominance. Rest and digest is called parasympathetic dominance. There's only two states. You're either one or the other. And so we, as a generally, as people in modern society are in constant fight or flight, mm -hmm. constant chronic daily stress from mm -hmm. work, from relationships, from fears and worries, from guilt and shame, from bitterness and resentments toward people in the past, right? Jealousy toward people that have more than us. Mm -hmm. And so I realized I had, I had to get control of my thoughts. So I gave my fears to God as when they'd creep in. When I would start to feel jealous and envious, I would stop and I would start counting my blessings, mm -hmm. right? I would practice gratitude. I'd say, okay, wait a second. What do I have to be thankful for, right? Okay, I don't have a Porsche like that guy, right? But what do I have to be thankful for? I have a car, right? <laughs> right? I have a wife who loves me. Mm -hmm. I have a home. I got out of bed this morning. I can feed myself. I can walk and talk. I can hear. I can see. Yeah. I have enough money to pay my next set of bills. Right. Like life is great. Yeah. I am so blessed. And, and that simple practice of counting your blessings will transform your attitude Absolutely. instantly, right? It'll instantly take you out of that uh, bad habit of comparing yourself to people who have more than you, right? Which produces envy and jealousy and resentment and into a state of gratitude and contentment and thankfulness. Mm -hmm. 
So don't compare yourself to people that have more than you. Compare yourself to people who have less. Which is my, the vast majority of the world. And we take so much of that for granted in the United States. 99% of people in the world have less than you. Right. <laughs> like, hello. Right. Uh, don't focus on the 1% of Americans that are richer, right? Mm -hmm. How about focus on the 99% that are poorer than you? Yeah. That will make you happy. It will produce contentment and gratitude. That is my advice. And now I have a gratitude hack, which is if I start to get frustrated, you know, by someone or things in life that aren't going my way, and it happens, I can stop in the moment and just say, you know, right now there's someone dying in the hospital that would give anything to trade places with you. Amen. All I have to do is just kind of dwell on that for just a moment and remind myself that most things that are not worth being upset about and there are people who would love to have my problems, right? Yeah. They would love to have my problems. Yeah, absolutely. And so that, that I hope, I hope your audience will, will take that and use it because it is true. There are people dying in the hospital right now that would love to trade places with you. Right. So don't let the little things steal your joy. Don't let problems in life steal your joy. And when problems become too big to solve, that's when you got to give them to God. Mm -hmm. Obstacles come into our life for one of two reasons, either to be overcome or to divert you onto a new path. Mm -hmm. Right? So either way, if it's important that you have the right perspective instead of getting angry and resentful and, oh, this is terrible. You can choose to believe that, you know what, God's going to work this for my good. And there's a better path, right? I thought I was on the best path, but I'm getting diverted and this is going to be a better path for me. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean you have to like it, right? I like, I may not like it. <laughs> I didn't like cancer, but I believed that it was going to be better for me. Somehow, some way my life would be better. Mm -hmm. And I was, I couldn't even imagine what it would be like, right. but it's way better than I awesome. <laughs> even could have imagined Yeah. now. So, I mean, I've got two beautiful daughters and a wife and a nice home and, you know, it's, I'm, I'm able to do what I do. I've, you know, written three books and, you know, people want to talk to me and they want to hear what I have to say. And that's a wonderful, fulfilling feeling to be able to share what you've learned with mm -hmm. other people. It's the best feeling ever. And so the one other thing we got to talk about before we run out of time is dealing with your past, right. because uh, if you have bitterness and resentment and anger towards people who've hurt you it's going to eat you up inside it's you know the old expression is bitterness bitterness is like drinking poison mm -hmm. and hoping that it hurts someone else right and it doesn't right it the the longer and the more bitter you become the more it poisons you it it poisons your heart it pollutes your heart and creates a sick heart and if you have a sick heart you're going to have a sick body right it's just a matter of time uh and so there is a way out. There's a way to free yourself from the prison of pain that you may be in. And that way is called forgiveness. Mm -hmm. That means releasing the, that person, letting them go, giving them to God, mm -hmm. choosing not to carry the anger anymore, right? Surrendering your anger to God. And I, I made a decision to forgive every person who had ever hurt me in life every single one by name. And you can't do it in two minutes. You right. know, it, it takes time. You have to like deliberately sit down and think through your life and think about your past and, you know, pull open the filing cabinet in your mind where you've stored the painful memories mm. and one by one, right? You have to revisit them and make a decision to forgive that person for what they did. And so I would just, you know, and the easiest way to do it is chronologically, you know, you kind of think back, was somebody mean to me on the playground, you know, and how, how far back can I remember of someone being mean to me on the playground, right? It's like, start there, because that's and usually some memories pretty... memories popping up right now. <laughs> yeah, so those are usually pretty innocuous, but we all have them, right. you know, and so you start there and you think, oh, yeah, that little, that, that kid threw a rock at me one time or whatever, right? But say, you know what, okay, God, you know what they did? You know how I feel about it. You know, it hurt my feelings at the time. And I, you know, it's, I still feel a little something, right. but I'm choosing to forgive them. Amen. And I'm letting it go and I'm giving it to you. 
They're all yours. I'm not going to carry this anger anymore or this resentment or bitterness anymore. And forgive me for holding on to this for mm -hmm. so long. Yeah. And I'm asking you to bless them. I hope you don't, but I'm <laughs> asking you to, <laughs> right? I'm asking you to anyway, mm -hmm. right? Because Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Mm -hmm. Jesus talked about forgiveness a lot yeah. over and over. And one of the last things that he did on the cross as he was dying was said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Right. So he actually, uh, you know, uh, he chose mercy and forgiveness in the most difficult moment of his life. Right. right? Can you imagine that? It's, it's the last thing you want to do is mm -hmm. forgive people who have nailed you to a cross and are sitting there spectating, right? Right, right? Like eating popcorn, basically, right. while you're dying. Uh, and, and he did it to show us that if he can do it on the cross, we can do it anywhere, right? right? No one's nailed you to a cross. Right. And I'm not trying to diminish the pain people have caused you because certainly people can cause a tremendous amount of pain. Right. But the pain, you know, the, whatever they did, that's in the past, it's over right? And if the pain persists, it's only because you are allowing it to persist in your life. And you have control over this. And when you forgive, it doesn't excuse them, it doesn't make it okay. But yeah. it's you deciding I'm going to put this down, right? I'm carrying baggage, and it's weighing me down. Mm -hmm. And I'm putting the bags down. Right? I'm putting down the bag. And I'm walking away from it. And this is the most freeing, transformative, healing thing you can do. Absolutely. It, I mean, I'm a huge advocate for plant-based diet, raw foods, juicing, exercise, lots of lots of wonderful therapies and supplements that I talk about in my books and all kinds of great stuff, right? But I also talk about this a lot, right? right? Because if you're taking a holistic approach to health, you can't just do the physical stuff. Absolutely. You have to address your mental, emotional, Absolutely. and spiritual health. Yep. And when all of those come into alignment, then you you're you accelerate the healing process. Mm. And so I've met cancer patients who, you know, they they're doing everything right, but supposedly, right. Uh, but they were still really angry, mm. right? Really fearful, really angry, really bitter, and they wouldn't forgive the people who'd hurt them, and they didn't do well, right? Because that anger is so toxic, and it suppresses your immune system. So again, all this is coming back to, to, to the immune system, right? Whether you want to protect yourself from cancer or help yourself heal cancer or protect yourself and help yourself heal from chronic, excuse me, from infectious diseases. It's the same approach, <laughs> which is great. You don't have to do something different, right? If you take care of yourself in a way that you never have before, um, you will strengthen your body and your immunity and improve your life. And you have nothing to lose and everything to gain yeah. by doing these things. Right. You and, get results that you've never had before. <laughs> yeah. And you know, I get it. It's hard to break your bad habits, but for some people, it may be easy because they're facing cancer. For others, it's like, well, I'm not really actually sick. I don't, you know, it's harder for me to do that. Mm -hmm. And I want to say this too. When we're under stress, and remember, stress is stuff from your past stuff in the future and in the present like so you've got to identify where am i where am i deriving stress from right because before cancer i wasn't a worrier i never worried about anything right but then you get cancer and all of a sudden now you got fear and worry right so i had to recognize like oh this is new for me this, this fear all the time uh, but you've got to identify where where are my stressful thoughts coming from and they may be coming from all three they may be coming from your past from the present and from the future but once you sort of identify, okay, what am I doing? How am I thinking this producing the stress? And you forgive and you start giving your fears to God and you practice gratitude. You, you start these developing these habits, right? You exercise your forgiveness muscle. That's what I like to call it. Yep. The more you do it, the easier it gets and the stronger you become. This is all really important because when we're under stress, we will self-medicate. Mm-hmm. 
right? When we are stressed, we will find ways to medicate the stress, to alleviate the stress. Mm -hmm. How do we do that? Well, food, yep. cigarettes, alcohol, drugs, right. illegal drugs, legal drugs. Right. Pe people seem to think like, oh, my, my doctor gave me a prescription, <laughs> right? It's like, yeah, but it's still not good for you, okay? Uh, sex addiction, gambling, being a shopaholic, being uh, binge watching, video games. So there's a lot of ways that people are distracting themselves, yeah. right? Or uh, chemically mediating their stress. Right. And it's really hard to break addictive behavior if you don't get to the root cause of your pain. Right. Right. And this is usually why, right? Almost always why people go back to, or they move from one addiction to another. Exactly. Right? Cause they're still in pain. Right. And I, I want to just, I wanted to put that out there so that people understand if you have a, if you have a, a water dripping from your ceiling, you can put a bucket under it. Right. And that will, um, that will mitigate the damage. So you may not ruin your floors. Right. But the water's still dripping and eventually your ceiling will become saturated. Right. And it'll fall in. And then you got a huge mess, right? So if you want to stop the leak, you got to get up on the roof and find the hole and patch the hole. Right. Right. You have to solve the root cause of the problem. The and so then when it makes it becomes easy to break your uh, bad habits mm -hmm. that you're using to ameliorate or mitigate your stress. Sure. Right. So again, forgiveness heals your heart, right? It removes that pain. And when you don't have the pain anymore, you don't need to medicate the pain, right? right. You, you won't be dr drawn to medicating this pain from your past when you forgive people who've hurt you. It's so powerful. Mm -hmm. okay. It's so profound. And again, Jesus talks about forgiveness a lot. Mm -hmm. It's his whole ministry is about forgiveness. And really, it's the major theme, <laughs> right? So take Jesus's advice. Jesus Christ gives good advice. <laughs> yes. So uh, so I love to talk about forgiveness because it's so powerful and it's not talked about enough right. and it really can transform your health. And again, solve the pain problem, right? And when you solve the pain problem, it's easy to make healthy choices and stick with them. You're not drawn back to destructive behaviors. And so stress, just to close the loop on this, stress is really the underlying cause of most chronic disease, right? Yeah. Because when we're stressed, our immune system is suppressed. Your body becomes more prone to inflammation. Okay, so that the, immunosuppression and inflammation are the recipe for chronic disease. Mm -hmm. So your body's in that state, and then you're alleviating your stress with unhealthy habits, right? right? overeating or drugs or alcohol or whatever and that's compounding the stress and the detrimental effects to your body so do you see this vicious this is a vicious cycle yeah that's happening with stress so when you break that cycle you you turn it's like you know you're going this way you break the cycle and then you start going this way right it becomes wow. you go from a vicious cycle downward to a virtuous cycle and your health and your happiness spiral up <laughs> right? That's what you want. And anyone can do this, right? Anyone can break the, a vicious cycle that they're in of bad habits and stress, right? And, uh, but the first step is like, kind of like AA, you have to admit you have a problem. Yep. Right? Once you admit you have a problem, you see like, okay, I've got problems in my life. They're probably my fault. I need to start taking action to solve my problems right. and solve my stress and forgive people who've hurt me and trust God with my future and stop being envious, right? Let's just start there and start eating fruits and vegetables and start exercising, right? The physical stuff. You are on your way. Exactly. Right? These are the simple things. And that anyone can do this stuff. It's not expensive. You don't need a degree, right? All you need to do is be willing to change. If you want to get well, you want to improve your life, all you have to do is be willing to change, to make changes, and then to stick with them, to be consistent. And for me, I, I figured out, I decided that I wanted to live. I wanted to get well. I believed I could get well. Mm -hmm. And I decided, well, I, or I, 
I got very clear on what I had to live for. Mm. Right? What is my reason to live? Why am I doing this? Why am I eating giant salads every day when I, you know, normally I'd be eating cheeseburgers mm -hmm. because I had a wife and two parents that I didn't want to see put me in the ground. Right. That was my why, right? What's your why? We all have different ones, but when you realize I'm doing, I'm not just doing this for me, I'm doing this for other people in my life that I care about and who care about me. And I want to be around to care for them and to live life with them and to love on them and, and all that. So there's, there's a piece of the puzzle there in terms of finding the motivation to, to make these big changes in your life. Yeah. You just have to be clear on what you want and why you're doing it. And once you get there, then it becomes easier to, to make the changes and stick with them. Yes. And determination is really a much more important quality than motivation because motivation is very flighty, right? Yes. Motivation comes and goes. Some days you feel like it, some days you don't. And you can't use that as an excuse, right? I'm, I'm just not motivated. Exactly. Well, if you want to achieve anything, you have to have determination. Yep. And determination is the drive to do it when you don't feel like it, exactly. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Because you realize there's something more important, right? That you realize there's a goal that you're trying to reach. It's like writing, I've written three books. You can't write a book overnight. Mm -hmm. You can't write one over a weekend, not a good one. I mean, it's a long process and it requires determination because you, because I can see the end product, right? right? I know at the end, it's gonna be great. In the middle, it stinks, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Yep. And at the beginning too, most of the process is not fun. It's, it's just work, right? right? It's a lot of energy and effort and time, but you, I see the end is like this book that I'm gonna be so proud of. And, uh, and so it's that analogy plays out in any, you know, in any endeavor, right? Any pursuit in life uh, that you can't accomplish in a day or in a week, right? This Absolutely. sort of long-term project and rest, restoring your health, right? You can't do it overnight. It takes time. Long-term project, yeah. Yeah, it's, a, it's, an, it's an ongoing project. And, you know, once you get your health back or you kind of achieve optimal health, then you, you ha still have to maintain it, right? Yep. You still have to be consistent because your health is is never static. You never arrive and then it just stays there. Exactly. Right? Atrophy is a okay. is a real thing, right? Yeah. You use it or lose it. <laughs> and so thing. that works. Yeah, and so that's why I still work out five or six days a week because I want to be healthy and strong tomorrow. Right. right? I don't work out because I want to be healthy today. I work work out and I eat healthy because I want to be healthy tomorrow. That's the way I. I think about it. I want to live a long life. And, uh, yep. and I've still, you know, got 50 or 60 years of life yep. to live. Right. So my motivation now obviously is not surviving cancer. It's just living a long, healthy life, free of chronic disease with a strong immune system and, and not being afraid or susceptible to some, whatever infectious disease is going around. Right. So I know I've said a mouthful and, and, uh, and so amazing. your audience took notes. <laughs> it's so good. And this is why I knew that I couldn't wait to have you on because I knew that it's so much more than just here's some healthy recipes. You know, it's so much more than just the physical health. So I really, really appreciate you going into more detail and in depth about that, about the, your personal experience, but what you've seen from other people too, because everything that we do here at the Healthy Christian Women podcast and at Fit Plus Faith is helping mind, body, and spirit together. And they are not inseparable. They cannot be separated. They're absolutely intertwined the way God created it. But what's so beautiful is he gave us Jesus. He gave us the answer to our problems and our stress. He gave us not just eternal life, but how to live in that place of abundance and health in our mind and in our heart with him now. And then he gave us everything that we need for our body, both in our ability to move and our ability to be active and, and create physical health like that, but also in the foods that he gave us. I'm like, God gave us everything. He gave us Jesus for our mental and emotional health and our spiritual health. And he gave us the food that the earth creates. Like, it's amazing. God set it all up for us. And we just have to get back to the basics about that, but it's really powerful. So 
I appreciate everything that you've shared. Uh, this is why it's an absolutely perfect uh, guest to have on our podcast. So thank you so much. So tell us where we can connect with you further. And I'll definitely be putting um, links to your books down below in the podcast as well. Well, thanks for having me. And I just want to agree and echo with what you said is the truth is simple, right? The truth is simple. Lies are complicated. And the more you can gravitate towards simplicity in your life, and we realize that you know, the advice that we get from the Bible is very simple, <laughs> right? It's simple stuff. If you'll just follow the advice that oh. you get from Jesus, right? Follow the 10 commandments, yeah. like, you know, they really are there to produce a life that is full of joy and mm -hmm. contentment. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, uh, so people can find me at chrisbeatcancer.com. I started that website 11 years ago. And started it to share my story and then it grew to be so much bigger than me and i've interviewed dozens of doctors and survivors who've healed all types and stages of cancer against the odds with a holistic approach yes. and um so there's it's just a huge repository now of resources and you can use the search bar and just type in breast cancer or garlic or curcumin or vitamin d yeah. i mean you know there's a lot of great stuff there um, and then, yeah, I've written three books, Chris Beat Cancer, that my, my first book came out in 2018, and that tells my story, and there's a big expo on the cancer industry, and then, of course, explains what I did to get well. And then Beat Cancer Daily came out last year, and that's a 365-page da daily reader. And it's kind of a, some days are very devotional, and then other days are more just inspiration motivation and practical advice mm -hmm. you know so it's a it's a mix of mental emotional spiritual uh psychology and uh and again just those practical reminders so that you can stay on the healthy path mm -hmm. right and keep things simple and make sure your focus is in the right places uh, so that was a really fun book to write and put together and i started it in the, at the beginning of 2020 and then uh and then the new book just came out a couple of weeks ago beat Hi. cancer kitchen mm. and we also started that book in 2020 so i started two books at the same time <laughs> don't recommend it <laughs> <laughs> but uh uh anyway but it, awesome. we did finish it it took the book cookbook took a lot longer uh and then it was supposed to but we finished it this year and it and it, now it's out and it's full color hard cover mm -hmm. uh, there's two sections and i'll just say this real quick sure you know, it's, it's beautiful recipes in here, but there's two sections. The first section of the book is the hardcore anti-cancer diet. So it's like, if you have cancer or if you're trying to prevent a recurrence, these are the foods you should be eating every day. And these are very simple recipes that are optimized for anti-cancer nutrition. Okay. And then the second part of the book is uh, recipes for just health and prevention, just fun stuff, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, snacks, smoothies, juices, uh, desserts. Mm -hmm. And, um, so it's, it's really, it's not just a book for cancer patients. It's, it's mm -hmm. a book for anyone who wants to eat healthier. You want to eat more plant-based and you want some new and fresh ideas that are delicious and that are easy to make, mm -hmm. right? That you don't have to get a dehydrator or any fancy quick kitchen <laughs> equipment to make any of these recipes. Uh, yeah. So we're excited about but it. My wife and I, I can't wait to together. dive in more. Mm -hmm. It was really fun. And it's just, uh, yeah, it's, great for it to be finally be out in the world. Yes, exactly. Your labor of love all this past year and a half for these two new books, which sound absolutely incredible, um, is just so worth it. Just like you started the journey, you planted the seeds, it grew, and then it finally came to fruition. And now you get to reap the harvest from it. Um, so that's just so beautiful. So let me pray for us then as we wrap up. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Absolutely. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this time. Just thank you for just Chris's heart and his journey and the difficult things that he's gone through that he's willing to share with others that when we go through pain, when we go through anything in our life, the story of our testimony that comes out of that, God, you are so faithful. You are so good. You are working things for our good, even when we can't see it. And Chris's life is an absolute example of that. He didn't understand what was happening. Why did he have cancer? All the scary things that happened there, but he trusted you. He believed you. He believed that you would work for his good in the midst of a life-threatening situation. And you did. And we thank you for that. We just praise you for that, for everything that you've done in, in all these past years that you've been using his story, his research, his heart, his passion, 
everything to help other people. It was never just for him, but it's become this beautiful global network uh, to help people get through the most difficult things in their life. And I just thank you and praise you, Lord, for that. We just um, pray for his business that you continue to grow it and prosper it with the incredible message of healing, of health, of hope, of turning to you in all things. You are the answer to all things. And we thank you, God. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, for what you did on the cross, obedience unto the end, that you were forgiving those that were persecuting you unto the end. We thank you, God, for that example. We thank you for everything you've created for us in nature to live healthy and whole the way that we were created to be until you take us home. We thank you and praise you for all these things in Jesus name. Amen. Awesome. Amen. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you so much to all of our amazing listeners. I hope you have thoroughly enjoyed this episode just as much as I have, and we'll catch you on the, ne on the next one. Have a great day. This is Dr. Melody from the Healthy Christian Women podcast. Bye. Thanks for listening. Remember to subscribe and join me next week for the next episode of the Healthy Christian Women podcast. Inspiring Christian women to live healthier in their mind, body, and spirit. One day at a time. Grab your complimentary mind, body, and spirit detox checklist at healthychristianwomen.com slash detox. That's healthychristianwomen.com forward slash detox. detox.